Okay, let's go through the mechanism here. Okay, excellent. You both worked that out. Um, we have a base here, so we expect it to deprotonate this alpha carbon. Uh, we're not going to deprotonate this alpha carbon, because it's not as acidic as the alpha carbon between the two carbonyls. We've already seen uh, why that is. Um, so again, I would still encourage you to keep labeling the alpha carbon. I'm not going to bother asterisking the carbonyls, though, because they're not doing anything in this reaction. But the alpha carbon is doing something, so I'll label that. Notice that we used ethoxide to match our L group over here. This way we don't need to worry about the competition where the nucleophile attacks here. Um, and we use the right solvent. Now, why did they bother making this? Um, by the way, this is an enolate, again. What, um, and of course, you could have drawn the resonance structure with the negative charges on the oxygens. But I prefer to draw the resonance structure with the negative charges on the alpha carbon, because that shows that the alpha carbon will be a nucleophile. What's the name of this reaction that happened in the second step? What type of mechanism happened in this step right here? SN2? Yeah, it's really just an SN2, where we're using an enolate to do an SN2. Certainly a methyl is a very good candidate for a SN2 reaction. This wouldn't have worked with a tertiary, right? Um, but this will work fine here with a uh, methyl. So this is yet another way to form carbon-carbon bonds. This is yet another way to form carbon-carbon bonds using the 1,3-dicarbonyl. Now, notice, could we make this into an enolate? Yes. Yes. yes it still has one hydrogen. And then we could add another carbon chain. So oftentimes this is done, so there, uh, there could be a whole bunch of steps here. You could deprotonate, then do an SN2 that adds a carbon chain, then add base again, and then add, a different, add, a, add another carbon chain. And it could either be the same or different from the carbon chain we started with, so we could easily end up with two different carbon chains here. That would be four steps total, right? Deprotonate, carbon chain, then step three would be add base again to deprotonate again, and then in step four we could add another carbon chain and another SN2. How many times you can, do, can you do that? Well, we can only do it twice because this only started with two hydrogens. This alpha carbon started with two hydrogens, so we could do this process twice and add two more carbon chains to it. All right, so that's the basic um, key to the reactions of 1,3-dicarbonyls. They can deprotonate and then act like nucleophiles, including adding carbon chains onto them in an SN2, and we're always interested when we can do that. Um, if you wanted to do that, how could you synthesize this in the first place? Just what's the name of the mechanism that we could use to synthesize this? Yeah, we could have synthesized this by Claisen condensation. That's what we spent the whole first part of the session talking about. Um, as a homework exercise, you could figure out what starting materials you would need to make this. Um, so in a real synthesis problem, you would have to probably first make this and then add these things to finally get over here. So there can really be a whole bunch of steps put together. And the, and the final product might look very different from what you started with. So the, the difference in the product 
between algal and everything else we've learned compared to clazin is that in the product of the clazin you end with two carbonyls and in the product of aldol you end with either one carbonyl and a hydroxy group or a carbonyl and an alkene. That's very well put. Yeah, that's the exact right analysis. A and why is that? Well, remember that an aldol condensation uh, involves attacking an aldehyde ketone, and we've seen when you attack an aldehyde ketone, you can't reform the carbonyl that was attacked. So that's why um, one of the carbonyls gets destroyed. But in the Clayson condensation, we're attacking an ester, which can reform the carbonyl. And therefore, you end up with two carbonyls. One carbonyl from the molecule that formed the enolate, and one carbonyl from the molecule that was suffered the electrophilic attack. Um, but yeah, so because you were able to reform the carbonyl that was attacked, um, you, um, you ended up with the two carbonyls. And that never happened with the aldehyde and ketone attacks because you can't reform carbonyls there. That's why they're in separate chapters in the book. That's the whole reason why they're in separate chapters in the book. And that's also the reason why aldehydes and ketones are in the same chapter, because they follow similar reactivity. And all the carboxylic acids are in the same chapter because they can all, and derivatives are in the same chapter because they can all reform the carbonyl. That's how they decide who to put in which chapter, who's similar and who's different. Okay. All right, so this made sense to you. Um, now, something else that's very important here is decarboxylation. So we should talk about that. Here's a, here's a reaction. This is called a decarboxylation reaction, and we need to talk about this. I actually have another video series up where I talk a lot about decarboxylation, so I don't want to spend too much time on that because you can watch that other series. Uh, but. Uh, we haven't, we haven't had time to watch it yet, so we'll have to go over it because uh, this is important for what we have to do with the rest of the chapter. All right, can you see why this is called a decarboxylation? All that's happened is we've blasted off this carboxy group. Notice how the product is identical to the starting material, except it's lost the carboxy group. Decarboxylation is a very simple reaction. It simply blasts off the carboxy group without making any other significant changes. Just to emphasize what's going on here, I'll put in some numbers to show where all the carbons went. Okay, um, you should know the mechanism for this reaction, um, but uh, to save time, I think we won't go through that. It's in the book, um, and uh, there's some other stuff to go through. Um, usually, you should not draw the mechanism unless you're asked for it. There's not too much percentage in drawing the mechanism unless you're asked for it. Um, all we're going to go through is how to draw the product here. Okay. Now, um, the thing I want to emphasize here, well, there's two things to emphasize. First of all, who can decarboxylate? What is, how do you decide who can decarboxylate and who can't? Carboxylic acids can decarboxylate. That's a good start. But only some decarboxylate, only some carboxylic acids can decarboxylate. So some can and some can't. The key is it's got to be a beta carbonyl carboxylic acid. Only, well, only beta carbonyl carboxylic acids can decarboxylate under moderate heat. Actually, I think if you have intense enough heat, you can decarboxylate lots of things. But under moderate heat, which is what you're going to be focusing on, these are the only, these are the only decarboxylations you can be expected to know about anyway. The only decarboxylations you can, are you going to use are for beta carbonyls carboxylic acids. All right, so you have to be very careful to check for both of these things. So how does that apply here? Well, it's easy to see that we have a carboxylic acid. Um, and then here's where it's very helpful to label. Can you see why this would be called a beta carbonyl? Because the carbonyl group is on the beta carbon. Now, it doesn't matter whether this is a ketone or a ester or a carboxylic acid, as long as it's a carbonyl. So notice I didn't say a beta carboxyl carboxylic acid. This does not have to be another carboxy group, although it could. This could be a carboxy group, too. Um, this can be pretty much any carbonyl-containing compound. Ketone, ester, carboxylic acid. 
Only one of the groups has to be a carboxylic acid. The other one just has to be a carbonyl, but it must be on the beta carbon. It doesn't do any good to have an alpha carbonyl or a gamma carbonyl. 